This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I right. Right. And, I was so and I just happy. thought, well... I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Jesse Dunyans. The story was recorded in February 2014 at American Junkie in Chicago, Illinois. For a lot of people, the competitions that define their high school experience were football or basketball or maybe mock trial or debate. But for me, the height of high school competition was the Science Olympiad. I got at least one Science Olympiad along here. I hadn't heard of this concept until my sophomore year of high school. A teacher suggested that I might want to join our school's new team. They, the, each team had to participate in a whole bunch of events that made up the overall competition, and they were still looking for some members to complete that team. Now for me, this was an unmissable opportunity. First of all, because science. And second, you know, I was this kind of nerdy kid. I never really participated in sports at all. And even in like the more cerebral competitions like Quiz Bowl, I just somehow never managed to make much of a contribution. But science, that was my domain. I loved science. I rocked at science. This was my chance to shine, to really help a school team to victory. You know, I say victory. It's not like we were confident we could actually win the whole competition. It was still the first year our school was sending a team. But we figured at least we would show up and we'd show everyone that the new kids on the block were a force to be reckoned with. So a lot of the events have been claimed by these hyper-advanced life forms known as juniors and seniors. Uh, They had taken some physics and were therefore obviously more qualified to build bridges out of toothpicks. But I had something they didn't. I had taken eight years of piano lessons, which by the standards of my teammates practically made me Mozart. So I was assigned to this event called Sounds of Music. And for that event, my teammate Ellie and I had to build two instruments in advance of the competition day and come in prepared to explain the physics of them and play a duet on them for a judge. So Ellie and I were all excited to start building our instruments. We see that the only pre-made instrument component we're allowed to use is guitar strings. So we figure, well, obviously that means that an instrument with guitar strings is a good idea. So we find these instructions in this like music book for five-year-olds uh, for building a banjo frame out of homemade stuff. And pretty soon we've assembled most of the banjo frame and we're figuring this, this instrument is pretty much in the bag. And that's where things stood for about six weeks. We just could not figure out a second instrument that we thought would work. So a week before the competition, we still have no idea what our second instrument is going to be. Finally, I stumble across this African thing called an mbira. This is about as simple as instruments get. You take a slab of wood, slap some metal on it, and you twang the metal. It's crude, it's easy, it's perfect. So I run over to my mom and I insist that we must, must, must make an emergency Home Depot run tonight. We go and buy this big board, wooden board, but we can't find any appropriate metal strips for the twanging bit. So I go and explain this to, to our faculty advisor the next day, and he, in his trademark way, says, no problem, no problem. And he takes me over to Fred. Fred is this short, slightly round, white-haired Italian guy. Officially, he's a school janitor, but really it would probably be more accurate to call him a building engineer. Fred's a tinkerer. And his DIY skills are so legendary that he's developed this cult of personality around himself. There's there's actually, there was a a club hour activity where students would just follow Fred around the building watching him fix things. (laughs) They built up this, this mythos of like mystery and power around Fred. 
they'd say things like, you know, Fred is actually a millionaire. He has this big, huge private cabin up in Massachusetts, and he just hangs around here to have something to do. So if there's anybody who can help me get my metal strips, it's Fred. The faculty advisor explains the situation to Fred, and Fred goes, eh, let me see what I can throw together for you. So he beckons me over into his home base, which is this big boxed off room, which was always locked. Turns out the reason it was always locked was that it was such a rat's nest of building supplies and tools that you couldn't move. But Fred is super excited to show off this little den to a student. He's showing off his collection of power drill bits, and he's showing me how he can use the vise to clamp pieces of wood for sawing. And I'm just looking around going, wow, so like how many workplace safety violations is that? <laughs> Whatever, I don't care. He's going to get me the metal. He pokes around a bit, can't find anything at first. But a few hours later, he runs up to me in the hall, waving this long, wide sheet of metal that kind of goes spraying when you bend it. I have no idea where he got this thing from. For all I know, he sawed it out of an air conditioning duct two minutes earlier. <laughs> but the material is perfect. I tell him that, and he cackles and disappears back into his lair for a minute, does some magic involving circular saws and power drills, and comes out holding 12 rough edge strips of metal. Okay, so we finally have all the materials to build our two instruments. But, you know, it's high school. You know how it is. Really busy. Saturday night rolls around. Competition's on Sunday. And so Ellie and I finally get to sit down and take stock. Here's what we have at this point. About three quarters of a banjo. <laughs> one package of guitar strings. A wooden board. Twelve exceptionally sharp bendy metal rulers. So that's no instrument, no duet piece selected, no written score for said piece, which was required, and basically no chance whatsoever as far as we could see. But we plug away through the night, and actually after a few hours, the Mbira is making these tolerably musical variations on a dull, funking noise. Like, dun, dun, dun. So that's great. The banjo, on the other hand, <laughs> Oh God, that poor banjo. Okay, so we're supposed to be able to explain the physics of this thing, right? So in physics, you learn about tension in strings. Have you ever tried to pull on a guitar string? It turns out those things are really strong. I looked this up afterwards. Apparently a normal guitar string is pulling on the pegs with the force of about a 30 pound weight, which may not sound like that much, except that this thing is made out of like balsa wood and cardboard with, with <laughs> Dinky little screws for pegs. So every time we try to string it up, the, the piece of cardboard that's supposed to keep the strings away from the body would just collapse. And, and then we'd finally slop enough Gorilla Glue on there to keep it up for two seconds, and, and the end of the string would break. And then we'd finally get that fixed, and we'd turn the pegs to try to get tension in the strings, but the tension in the strings was so strong, it would unwind the peg as you were playing a note. So you'd pluck the string, and it'd just make this sad, like, noise, like, like a diseased pigeon. <laughs> And it didn't help that the particular piece of cardboard Ellie had chosen for the face of this thing made it look like some kind of bizarre billboard for total cereal. And then, at midnight, Ellie goes, oh, so, um, by the way, do you know how to play the guitar? Because I don't either. <laughs> this is really not looking good. But by the time we quit at, at 3 a.m., I had totally lost heart. There goes my big chance to shine. I mean, it's going to be all I can do just to show up. Like, we'll be, I'll be lucky just to listen to, he, to myself play, to survive. So the next day of the competition, we're desperately trying to fix up these instruments, and Ellie tries a little bit to learn a few notes on the guitar. Inconveniently, the Mbira is now out of tune, and we left our tuning screwdriver back at school. The banjo, meanwhile, the notes are still erratic frequencies occasionally intersecting the normal range of human hearing. As for a performance piece, the best we could do was a copy of Mary Had a Little Lamb, which was scribbled on some hand-drawn music paper by a team member with a good memory. <laughs> Ten minutes before performance time, I am so nervous, I can't stand still. This is going to be so mortifying. Ellie and I are actually wondering what would happen if we just don't go. But our teammates are like, no, you have to at least show up. So I walk into this surprisingly small, cramped room, judging room, and face this single, smiling music teacher. I'm clutching my slab of metal and wood, literally cold with 
dread at how much I'm about to humiliate myself. The judge takes one look at our instruments and says, well, those certainly look impressive. We didn't really know what to say to that. Like, <laughs> did you see the total serial part? <laughs> she asked us to play a scale each, and I obligingly dunk, dunk, dunk up the imbira. Ellie, meanwhile, gets out a few upwardly mobile notes, <laughs> like, beer, 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 beer. He ran out of notes he knew, so he just kept plucking the top one a few more times <laughs> until eventually the judge took pity and told him he could stop. <laughs> we hand her our Mary had a little lamb. She, you know, we're blushing furiously. She just grins and says, okay, go ahead. I think the song was actually recognizable, which is even more amazing in retrospect because Ellie told me afterwards that he realized halfway through the piece that he was playing the same note the entire time. <laughs> Finally, this farce is over. We flee the room. It was embarrassing. It was terrible. We can't believe how much we let down the team, but at least it's over. A couple hours later, we're in the awards ceremony. The announcer is going through event by event, by event and announcing medals. And every time she awards a medal to TABC, which is the name of our school, we get all excited. It's not clear, though, how we're doing overall. When she gets to the Sounds of Music competition, she starts off with this scathing comment. I would just like to say that we feel most teams did not do justice to this competition. <laughs> oh my God, the shame. It's like she's talking directly to us. <laughs> Our whole team, which they, they knew exactly what, we were, what state we were in two minutes before performing. They start casting sad glances in our direction and Ellie and I are burying our faces in our hands as the announcer goes on, almost no one submitted written sheet music. Oh, we did at least write down, Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> and she says, your instruments were supposed to play in the octave below middle C. And Ellie and I look up at each other and like, we got that part right, I think? Finally, she finishes complaining about event specifications and announces, third place, TABC. Ellie and I are in total shock. This is impossible. Our entire team starts giggling uncontrollably we, as we run up to grab our bronze medals. I mean, there's no way we are in third place. Like, everyone else must really have sucked. <laughs> about 10 minutes later, they were finished with all the individual event awards. But before they go on to announce the overall winners, they inform the room that there has been a mistake in the Sounds of Music competition. <laughs> and in fact, the easiest thing would be for everybody to just hand back in the medals and they'll redistribute them properly. So we're like, yeah, of course, this explains everything. <laughs> like, there's no way we could have gotten third place. <laughs> So we trudge back up and hand in the medals and head back to our seats, hanging our heads in shame again. And just as we're getting comfortable, we hear, second place, TABC. <laughs> so now we're like looking around to see, maybe we fell into a sitcom or something. This is just getting out of hand. <laughs> and our, our faculty advisor is wheezing when we come back with the silver medals. He's like, you know, we should just run away before they try to take away your awards again. <laughs> But before we can move, they start announcing the overall winners. And we thought we had maybe a, sec a, a shot at third place based on the numbers earlier, but third place goes to another team and second place goes to another team. And so we've, we've just given up when they announce first place overall, TABC. <laughs> so our whole team starts clapping and slapping Ellie and me on the back. And you know, you know this, this is just, I'm just riding this, this wave of absolute joy, which is made so much sweeter by the fact that it came out of this almost disaster. Apparently, we'd done so well in the Sounds of Music competition that it had bumped up our team score just enough that we'd gotten into the lead. So now, as I'm running up to claim this trophy with my teammates and 14, 14 other teammates all jumping up and down and cheering and, and slapping each other on the back, and I'm just thinking, you know, I guess sometimes you can get surprisingly far just by showing up.
That was Jesse Dunyetz. Jesse is a PhD student in computer science at Carnegie Mellon University. He teaches computers to understand language, coaxing them to stitch the pieces of a sentence into a coherent interpretation. He's also a founder and the current president of Carnegie Mellon's Public Communication for Researchers program, which helps graduate students learn and practice communicating science to people of all backgrounds. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org. We have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. We also depend on listeners like you for our support. If you're able, please consider donating at storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Evelith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to American Junkie for hosting the show, to our donors for supporting the show, and to my middle school track coach for making clear to me how much I don't like team sports. Thanks for listening. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.